Alright, so we'll start about 2 o'clock. My name is Eva Brito. I am the director <coughs> of the Women's Center here at Bristol Community College, so welcome if this is your first time here. Is anyone's first time here at the center? Okay. So I'll share a little bit about the center and then we'll go into Annabelle's speech today. The Women's Center is fairly new. We're about a year and a half years old here at the center and we're very fortunate to have a Women's Center. We're one in three community colleges that have a Women's Center. So the Women's Center is a space for all students despite its name, regardless how you identify in this world, you can have a space here at the Women's Center. And it's a safe space where students can feel safe and supported with any issues that you may have. Part of my background is I'm a licensed social worker, so I have a lot of experience working with individuals um, that have dealt with trauma or crisis, but um, we do that end and we also have fun here. A little bit about the space that we have. Uh, we have a lactation room right behind you, so that's if someone's a parent um, and still nursing, we have that space there. We also have a lending library here behind me of books. So if you have a paper to do with something with women's rights or women's issues or something, you'll probably find a book here that can help you in that endeavor. Behind us, actually there's a student in there, that's why the door's closed. There's a study area with a computer, so if you don't want to go to the library and you want to get some work done, it's a nice lit room, you can get that um, done in here. And behind me is a professional closet, as you probably saw the sign outside. And it has all gender clothing, there's some men's suits, there's um, accessories, purses, everything. So if you have an interview, per se, and you don't want to go to Macy's or somewhere else to buy the clothing, you can come here, all the items are donated, lightly used, and you can take it there. Um, and we're going to actually have an event. But really we're a space to advocate and talk about gender issues and gender equality and how we can have a more equitable world. And some of that is done through programming here at the center and educational um, programs and other times it's through community events. So you probably got one of these hopefully in front of you. So this tells you, it should have went around and there's some as well over there. This tells you some of the events that we're doing for the semester. I'm gonna just highlight a few of them that I think are worth noting. We partnered up with the New Bedford Women's Center and that is one of the oldest women's centers in the country. Sorry. It's over 45 years old and we're going to have a sexual assault counselor as well as a domestic violence counselor here on campus every Wednesday and every Thursday. They're going to be in the G building, but if you needed them to talk a little bit more about what was happening, they would come here and you'd have a private space to talk to them. So that's really good because it's currently I'm the only one on staff um, and I can't do as much, but they have a lot of staff, they do groups, they do all that. So that's good to know if you have any concerns or you know someone that's in an unhealthy relationship, they can support you in that. Um, we are also uh, going to start a nursing support group here. If there's any nursing students that's going to be here. And a Spanish speaking support group. Actually, Rosario Professor Perse is going to be starting a Spanish support group to really help uh, Latinx population. So it's just a space on Tuesdays from 12 to 1. You can come, bring your lunch, talk in your native language, and just have um, a good time. Rosario is going to want to practice your Spanish too. Yes. Yeah. Maybe you're taking a Spanish class and you class? want to get better in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's happening. We also have a parenting club. Uh, if anyone in the room is a parent, you can be part of the parenting club. And as you know, anyone here a parent? No? Okay. But it could be challenging to be a student and to be a parent, so that's the purpose of the parenting club. We have a lot of different events going on. Um, I'm going to highlight um, a few that I think make sense. One is related to the professional closet. We have a, an event on mm -hmm. April 7th, and we're going to have an event in the H building where we're going to have a fashion show using the clothes here. So we will give scenarios. Let's say you have a job interview and you're not sure what to wear. It's kind of like at home, you're like, what do I wear? So we look at this closet. We're going to have a professional stylist. We're going to have Rob Roy um, give free haircuts. We hope that we're not confirmed yet to maybe have also some headshots um, and some other things. So really something fun to really talk about how do you get dressed to present your best self for a professional event is happening. Um, March 11th, we're having an event in the H building to celebrate International Women's Day as well as Women's History Month. So that's on there. We're going to have a keynote speaker and a lot of different events that day. So that's an exciting day. We also partnered up with the Zeitzerian Theater in New Bedford and the New Bedford Historical Society for an event on um, April 2nd. And there's going to be an event called Seven, which is seven stories by seven women from seven different countries. It's a show that they're doing from LA. But we decided to do a South Coast Seven of that, in which we're going to put a call out to Bristol students. So seven 
women students that are interested um, can apply to be part of this program. And then we're going to put a nomination for seven women to get nominated that we think have really impacted our community. The students will then meet these women, write about them, and do their own performance on the C stage before the actual one. So that's a nice if you're interested in writing or um, the arts, that is a nice event. So there's a lot of stuff, and I think you all find a space here. What's important that you know is a student-centered space, so you can come here, you can talk to me if you have an idea of an event, or you can just come and hang out in the lounge area as well. Um, we have a lot of different resources here that we can support you with within the college and outside the college. So I spoke a lot, but hopefully that was helpful information about the Women's Center and how we can support you as students. And one of the things that we're really excited about is our stories that inspire. That's when we bring a speaker in and that individual shares their life story. And today we actually have an alumni of the college, Annabelle. I met her actually at a community event for the first time and I thought she was very articulate. And I said, well, you know, you'd be great to come to our center. She's like, I actually graduated from Bristol. And then a few months later, um, Rosario suggested her and now she's here. So I won't share her life story, but I'm excited to have her here. Um, so without further ado, Thank you, Eva. Um, I'm really glad to be here today. I mean, uh, when I was at BCC, we didn't have the Women's Center here, but it's just really great to hear all of the uh, great events and uh, different opportunities and resources that the center is offering. Um, so I, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so again, like Eva said, my name is Annabelle Santiago. I am from the Dominican Republic. Um, I graduated from here from Bristol Community College with a business transfer degree um, and then went on to UMass Dartmouth to do an economics degree. But we'll get more into that later. Uh, so just to let you guys know, I, I did put some pictures together. I know that it is behind you, so if you can take a glance. Um, yeah, so uh, this right here, these two pictures, um, for those of you who can't see, it's my mother and my father holding me as a newborn and then me as a baby. Um, this is where my story starts. So August 28th, 1996, I was born in the Dominican Republic um, in a city called Moca. So that is the place that I call home. Um, and I have a lot of family that still lives over in Moca. Um, uh, the neighborhood is actually called Monte de la Jagua. Um, and I mean, it, I think it, it's, it was a blessing to be, to be born in such a beautiful place and country. So for the first four years of my life, um, I actually spent in, in growing up in the Dominican Republic. My mother at the time when she had me, um, she, I was, I mean, she was 15 years old. So she was still very young. She was still a kid pretty much. Uh, so my grandmother, she had to do a lot of um, the like caretaking for me. Um, a, year and af a year and a half after my, I was born, my brother was born. Uh, so my grandmother took care of both me and my brother. I had other uh, cousins. We all lived in this very little house. It had two bedrooms. Um, you can actually see it up on the picture on the upper left. Um, that's us sitting in the front gallery of the, of the home. And then the picture below that is me and like the, the garden, um, obviously enjoying myself there. Um, and then the picture up on the right is my brother and I. Um, I have really great memories over there. I, I actually was recently in the Dominican Republic and I was just uh, reminiscing with my grandmother. And she was just telling me about uh, a bunch of different stories about the time I ran out and fire ants are biting up and down my legs and I was screaming like, holy hell. Um, then there was this other time, I guess I was uh, out, they had roosters and chickens out in the backyard. Um, and I almost got my eye poked out by a chicken because I was like playing with her babies. Um, so, and then there's good memories, like when my great grandmother used to call me from a house over 
saying that she had prepared ice cream for me. So I would go running for that ice cream. Um, and we, it was a good four years. I remember all of it, but I'm glad to have people in my life that can tell me stories like that. So my father's side of the family ended up coming over to the United States. Um, a lot of my father's siblings and his like aunts and uncles um, came and then they settled in Lynn, Lynn and Salem area, that's in the North Shore of Mass. Um, so there was a time during the first four years of my life where my father used to go back and forth visiting us um, when he could until eventually he brought us over. If you look at the top right picture, that's me and my brother coming uh, into the United States for the first time, uh, again, at four years old. Uh, the picture below that, uh, that is the house I actually grew up in. My father has nine sisters and a brother. So imagine all of us just packed in into a two bedroom apartment in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, it was difficult, but manageable. Um, and I think gave, gave me all the opportunity that I needed now um, that I couldn't understand back then, I guess. I was very sad to come. Um, so come 20, 2001, um, and I was registered into pu the public school system. These pictures are just some pictures from elementary school. Um, I was an ELL student, so I uh, spent most of my time in kindergarten, first grade, and the first year of second, I mean the first half of second grade um, in ELL classes until then I was like kind of eased into just regular class, classes. Um, I think, I don't know, elementary school was difficult. It, it was, it's actually funny to me because like when I remember, I thought I was like killing it. Uh, I thought I was doing so good in elementary school. And then yesterday I was actually looking through this, like the packet that they give you at the end um, when you graduate from high school. They give you this packet with like all of the, your report cards and everything. And I'm like reading, oh, Annabelle needs to make progress on this and that. And I was like, wow, like I thought I was doing better than this, but okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep remembering how I remember it. Um, so, and then some pictures shared below is just me graduating from fifth grade. Um, and the reason why I share that picture is because um, despite like all my challenges, the language barrier, um, being in ELL classes and sometimes being or feeling like the other, um, I used to try to make light of things and just like come in with like prepared jokes for my teacher. Um, my teacher in the bottom right, uh, in the bottom right corner, uh, Ms. Tidsdale, she, she she really like advocated for me. She was really there for me when I needed her. And like, I always came prepared with like the corniest joke of jokes. So I ended up winning like some sort of award for being like one of the nicest and like, like trying to always stay positive and, um, uh, and being funny, I guess. But I guess that's debatable. debatable. Um, and then after elementary school, I went on to obviously middle school, Collins. Um, I started doing uh, less well than I had, I guess I had thought I was doing in, in elementary school. Um, but a lot of the support that I received from my teachers and my guidance counselors um, in middle school really, I think, made such a difference for me. Um, in eighth grade, I actually ended up going in and taking some like uh, etiquette classes because I was so shy and I kind of just wanted to get out of that. Uh, and that really helped me a lot. And the person who, who, uh, who was in charge of giving those classes actually, she, she ended up being 
a mentor for the rest of my life. I, even now, I still like contact her and when we connect, like she definitely made a difference in my life. Um, and then high school, uh, I didn't do so well in high school. Um, I was socializing a lot, you know, getting into things that high school students get into. Um, and then eventually I graduated. But during the, during the process in high school, I feel like throughout my life, I've always, even when I wasn't doing too well, I've always had people who supported me. And even in high school, again, there was teachers and guidance counselors there. Um, and even like uh, the resources that the school had, like uh, on-site therapists, uh, those things were so crucial to me. And I think it's, it's what kept me above water um, and not like failing out of everything. So uh, there was also, it, my junior year of high school is when I kind of started to start thinking about college and what I wanted to do after high school. And um, I joined this college success. It was this nonprofit. It was in downtown Salem, right near where I lived. I was like, they, they could help me like, manage this college process that my parents know nothing about coming from the Dominican Republic, not having finished high school or ever done anything. Um, with like the college system here in the United States. So it was like a very difficult process to navigate on my own. So that's why I, I seeked out help from, from this group. Um, and it ended up being that, um, hold on, backtrack a little bit. So my mother became a citizen when I was a, a citizen when I was in the fifth grade and through her citizenship, I, I got naturalized, pretty much. Um, but I never got proof that I was not a naturalized citizen. So then uh, when I started applying to colleges, they wouldn't take my financial aid because I had to prove I was a citizen. And that ended up being very difficult. I, I actually, I didn't end up going to college um, right away after high school. I took a year off because I had to wait for a family member to have the funds or have planned a trip to the Dominican Republic so that they can go and deal with the bureaucracy over there to get my, my birth certificate, then bring it back home. And then I had to go get it notarized and translated. Um, it was a very hard process and like not having uh, a lot of like money or resources or my parents not really knowing um, what to do it was it was difficult and frustrating. Um, there was a lot of tears, but that it ended up okay. Because a year later, I ended up moving from Salem to Fairhaven um, at 18 years old, and I started BCC. So, um, so coming into BCC, uh, my my mind was set at. I'm going to be an accountant. So what I did was enrolled myself in the business transfer, business administration transfer degree. And I started taking a lot of accounting classes. I took some economics classes. Um, and then there's like all that room that you have to take electives. So one of my friends, actually recommended that I take this sociology class and um, that sociology class was called race and race relations and I decided to take it I'm like I have a free spot next semester I can take that class uh, I really liked the material I learned so much um, in that class and because of that class I actually, the professor, Dan Gilberg, he's actually pictured up there in the red shirt. Um, he kept wanting me to volunteer for the Coalition for Social Justice. <laughs> and he kept asking me if I would come volunteer for this election um, and do door knocking on the Cape or maybe do some door knocking 
in New Bedford. And I was just like, no way. Like, I'm too shy for that. I, I don't want to be talking to strangers. Like, I don't even know anything about what you're talking about. So, like, how, how could I possibly get into that? Like, and plus, I'm going to be an accountant. So what are we going to be doing uh, volunteering over there? These are all the thoughts that went through my head. Until, but he was very persistent. Uh, and then there was one time we had a guest speaker actually in one of our classes and uh, Dan's wife Marlene was actually there as well and then she gave it a try to kept trying to push me to volunteer or like uh, do something with CSJ and then uh, at the time they were working on this this campaign it was a ballot question. I don't know if you guys remember the charter school question. It was in 2016 um, when they were trying to like expand charter schools in Massachusetts. So um, I actually kept seeing ads and stuff for that on Facebook and hearing it on the radio. And like the yes side was the side I didn't agree with. And I was just like mumbling to myself, Marlene Hold heard me and she came over she's like you should come volunteer for this campaign um and I'm like okay fine I'll do it it was one of the like most eye-opening and inspiring experiences that I've had um and just like being just that teensy bit open to like trying something new um has brought me to where I am today and so I, I volunteered. We actually ended up winning the campaign. And then after that, I actually volunteered for a few months more. I did like a lot of phone banking, went up to Boston, Boston with them um, to go to like rallies or like hearings. Um, actually, one of the most impactful things that I went to when I was a volunteer was when we went for this like criminal justice reform bill. And when I got up there, like everyone that was making the decisions looked like they were from like the upper middle class um, and they were uh, white males. So, and I was like, this, this isn't representative of like who, who is impacted by criminal justice reform. Um, so how, how are they the only ones that are, are up here putting in their perspectives? We need more perspectives at this table. Um, and that really like stuck with me. Um, and then after, after that, that, so those four months, those four months that I was volunteering with CSJ was actually my last semester at BCC. And I had already done all of these business courses, this business administration degree. So um, it, now it was time for me to transfer over. I applied to UMass and I had no idea now. Oh my God, I just spent all my time taking all these business courses. And now I really like this thing, this ad advocating and politics and local politics, um, electoral campaigns. So it's like, what do I do? What, what are my next steps here? So that, after a lot of thinking, um, I ended up deciding that I should go for economics and go for an economics degree at UMass Dartmouth. And that was because I didn't want to lose all my business credits. Economics falls into business but economics also falls into politics so it kind of married the two together um, and i was able to keep all those credits that i earned and not have to do extra uh, years at umass dartmouth I, I made that sound like it was like prison or something <laughs> um but so yeah so uh, another thing i do want to mention about my bcc experience though was that before i I found CSJ, I did have a lot of professors that were super willing to like help you out. Actually, um, I don't know if ever, anyone has met Miss Perryman. 
Uh, so when I was like super into trying to do something with accounting, trying to become like a CPA, a certified public accountant, um, she actually even brought me to this like conference that they had in Rhode, Rhode Island while I was in her class too. Um, and then my other professor, uh, Patricio uh, George, he's an economics professor. He, he was also very influential for me um, here at BCC. He helped me out a lot and gave me a lot of advice. Um, so I would recommend for, for people here to like really like milk those relationships with your professors because they, they know what's possible, what's available, what the opportunities are um, for you. Um, So um, after I graduated from BCC, I actually got hired uh, at the Coalition for Social Justice part-time since I was still going to school at UMass Dartmouth. And I was able to do a lot of different things. Like um, I spoke at a Labor Day rally uh, about paid family and medical leave. I actually helped convene a, a regional table for southeastern Massachusetts uh, to try to get uh, legislators to commit to supporting the $15 minimum wage and paid family and medical leave. Um, and you can see that event pictured up at the top right. And then we did like a huge rally. There was hundreds and hundreds of people packed into the state house. Um, Again, for the same issues, paid family and medical leave, five for 15. I went on the radio. And then another huge accomplishment that I think um, means a lot to me uh, was with the Yes on Three campaign. And that was, was that last year? No, not 2019, 2018. Oh my God, time flies. Um, so, with the Yes on Three campaign, that was the first time I ever ran a Canvas team by myself. Um, and it was, I was covering all of Southeastern Massachusetts. So I was running a Canvas team, trying to recruit volunteers. Uh, I actually went on the radio for the ballot question and also did a series of talks um, on the Cape, in Fall River, wherever, in wherever they wanted me pretty much so i'm really happy with the outcome of that and it was great to actually win and just to say that was actually the transgender uh, ballot question that was on the bill um, uh, on the ballot in 2018. Um, so af after two years had passed i graduated from umass dartmouth um, with the economics degree, which was really great. Um, I guess one thing that I would say about studying economics is that it's very male dominated. Um, and it's, it's so, I feel like I, in my experience at UMass Dartmouth, it's like a degree that a lot of people don't get like when we were sitting in graduation, there was probably like 20 of us that graduated with an economics degree, but it was mostly males um, and maybe like a few females. So um, I think that uh, for, especially for, for women who are thinking about pursuing economics, um, uh, I think it's, um, I think it's, it, it's important to have more of us in that field um, for a variety of reasons. But um, after I graduated from UMass Dartmouth, I started working full time with the Coalition for Social Justice. Uh, and since then, so I graduated last, last May actually. Uh, since then, I actually have been put on the board of Family Values at Work, which is a national organization that's focused on passing paid sick days and paid family and medical leave in um, different states around the country and local um, municipalities and also nationally. Um, so 
I think that that has been very exciting for me. Um, because of that opportunity, I've actually been able uh, to travel to DC, to Detroit, to Washington State, to uh, speak on um, panels about paid family and medical leave and the work that we're doing around that now that we actually pass paid family and medical leave. Um, I've also been able to uh, participate heavily in the Ed Markey campaign this year. Uh, we did like this commercial um, for him, like a CSJ themed commercial. And the funny thing about it is that I guess they like bought slots of ads on YouTube. So like my family, they tell me all the time, my cousins are like, oh yeah, I was just watching music videos. And then like you came up and I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And then they show me and I'm like, oh my God, that's hilarious. And um, there's there was something else like that too that my mom was like, why are you popping up on my ads? <laughs> but it's it's really great to hear and see that they actually are seeing the work that I'm doing with the Coalition for Social Justice. Um, it's super important and it's something I'm very passionate about. So I wanted to finish off um, by telling you what I did most recently. So uh, in, Decem in December, this past December, I actually went back to the Dominican Republic for the first time in 10 years. And um, if you look at the picture to the left, those are all family members, cousins that I hadn't seen in over 10 years or had never met. And it was such a beautiful experience to be able to spend time with them and like actually get to know them. And there's just something about this like love that uh, they, they show me. I mean, my grandparents and, and um, my aunts and uncles, of course, but like these little kids that have never met me before are like running up to me saying how much like they care about me and they're so happy to see me there and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I guess that being able to go back um, was really valuable to me in that like I know that my family back home is watching all of the work that I'm doing and is supporting me through it and I know that I'm also being sort of like a role model for these kids. Um, I also wanted to mention as well my grandfather, which is on the far right picture. That's a picture that I actually took when I went back and he was just bringing me around. Um, if you went to his house and did not go see his farms, he would be insulted and frustrated at you. So every day I made sure to go to his farm with him, help him feed his animals, um, driving around to get things done. Um, it was really invaluable. And um, the, top, the top picture with the, um, the guy with the red shorts, uh, that's my partner and my grandmother actually sharing coconuts. Um, at my grandfather's farm. So it was a really great experience and I didn't know it until recently. Um, so two weeks ago, I actually lost my grandfather, the one in, on the right picture. Um, and one thing that I realized was that when I was over there, I kept feel, feeling guilty for spending too much time with him and not enough time with like the others um, that you see up there. And I feel like everything always works out exactly how it has to work out. Because I never knew that two weeks after me leaving, I was gonna lose him like that. But I actually ended up going back for his um, funeral and although it was a very sad moment, 
all of my family came together in his home. My cousins came together. And it's everything that he ever wanted. Like, all he wanted was to see us all together. All Me and my cousins all actually went and spent some time at his farm because, of course, that's what he would have wanted us to do. Otherwise, he would have been, like, yelling at us. Um, but I think that that was a very uh, enlightening experience for me just to go back after he passed because as a result of that, there was a lot of people in the community where he lived that kept coming up to us and telling us how great he was and how much of an advocate for, for the community he was. And um, even his workers on the farm were mourning him. We were able to sit down and have a drink with them um, and talk to them about things um, and then I, I really appreciate him and everything that he taught uh, me and the rest of my family. I think that in the work that I'm doing now, um, I'm kind of like carrying his legacy. And uh, I think people say like, l your legacy is, um, is every life that you touch. And he's touched a lot of lives, including mine. And the lives that I touch, will be a result of, of what he did throughout his life. He lived a pretty long life. He was 88 years old, so um, yeah. This, this last picture is, is him with his roosters. That's something that he loved. Um, and the second picture, the woman in the blue is my great grandmother. And the reason why I shared these two pictures with you guys is that the, my great grandmother, Anita, there's something that she always used to say and something I always mention uh, when I talk to groups is that her motto was, los que no viven para servir no sirven para vivir. And that means those who live, who do not live to serve, do not deserve to live. And I always carry that and try to honor that and all of the advocacy work and everything that I do. And now I have my grandfather up there too. And I hope that with everything I do in my life, I can also honor him. And what, what's coming next is just uh, making sure that I keep going back home and helping out my family, bringing all of the lessons that I learned here and all the knowledge uh, that I learned here to help people, well, to help my family back home and also here as well. Um, and always making sure to prioritize the people that we love. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my story. <laughs> what was the name of the sociology class that you said helped you and can you tell the students which other courses that you found valuable that were supposed to help you with your career goals yeah so uh, that course was called the race and race relations um, it's a sociology course. Um, and I guess other classes that helped me was definitely the public speaking class with you. <laughs> um, that really taught me that you actually need to practice a lot before you go out and do uh, any public speaking of that sort. So, I mean, I think that that was a really great class to take even before I started working at CSJ because I was um, I kept being like put in positions where I had to go do like presentations to classes or uh, speak in front of crowds of people and it can be very nerve-wracking but if you prepare and you practice um, 
you'll be fine. Uh, other classes, hmm. I really liked the corporate finance class. I don't, it, it sounds like way out of like the things that I'm into, but um, there was a, sp a specific project that we did in that class. And uh, it was like to, pr to do a presentation on some company. I don't remember exactly all the details, but like the professor made us like dress up and do these presentations in front of class so I think that that was a very valuable experience for me and then the fourth thing and the last thing that I will say that was very helpful to me when I was at BTC if you're still like in your first year at BCC I would really recommend you to look into like the honors program um, I mean you get like a scholarship at the end when you graduate which is great let me tell you that. Um, and just the, so there's, I, I think it still works this way, but there's ways that you can do it so that you can still take the classes that you'd like. Like, uh, for example, when I was taking the race and race relations class, um, I actually asked the professor if I could do an honors project with his class and ended up doing like a, 10, 15 page paper and a presentation to the class. Um, and that like satisfied the honors requirement. Um, so, I mean, I think it's, I, I don't think anybody should miss out on that. Um, you should definitely look into the honors program. Um, Yeah, the seminars, yeah. Yeah, and there was some there was some interesting honors classes too that weren't like offered as regular classes. So um and I think the the scholarship in the end ends up being like 2000. So definitely look into that. Mm hmm yeah and as part of the honors program too I think you since like there's a select number of students that participate in it you get to really know those people there those students so um, and then uh, there's also the requirement to do the presentation I think it's at UMass Amherst every year um, but that was pretty easy. Like it might seem intimidating at first and like it's a lot of work, but honestly, just do it. Just just do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, so right now at the Coalition for Social Justice, I'm the grassroots coordinator. Um, and each of the staff at the Coalition for Social Justice like takes responsibility for a certain um, like set of campaigns. And the work that I'm doing right now is around economic inequality. So. It's uh, advocating for things like paid leave and the minimum wage. But right now we're doing um, progressive revenue, trying to pass a millionaire's tax or trying to pass progressive revenue for um, the short term uh, for transportation. If you've seen like there's a bunch of articles going on in the Boston Globe about the state house um, trying to pass some sort of transportation revenue bill. So I've been really active in that, uh, trying to get legislators to um, meet with us and present this information to them. We actually work with um, Mass Budget and Policy Center 
which is a really great um, research hub, pretty much. And like all of the campaigns and stuff we do, like I have to be up on and know the facts and read the papers that Mass Budget puts out. And I think that having a background in economics helps me a lot and even just understanding those those papers that or reports that they put out. Yeah. Yeah. So um thinking of where to start. So this the beginning of last year um, there started to be some conversation that the legislature, the state legislature, would uh, pass some sort of um, transportation revenue bill to raise more money uh, to expand public transit in Massachusetts or to fix public transit because the MBTA sucks. <laughs> um, so what has been happening right now um, is that like a lot of corporate lobby groups and like business lobby groups are saying that um, anything that should be passed should be regressive and put on uh, the backs of people and people should pay if they're driving. May maybe we increase the tolls or um, increase bus fares or increase the gas tax, stuff that would impact us, everyone in, in this room pretty much. So what we have been very vocal about is saying that it shouldn't fall on just us businesses and corporations, large corporations who are in Massachusetts are benefiting and, and do benefit from like a, a good transit system. Um, their workers need to get to work on time. Um, and yeah, so, so our, again, our message has just been pushing back and saying that corporations should also pay. It shouldn't just be us. So. Um, this package that the legislature was supposed to, well, is working on right now, it was rumored that they were going to handle it by uh, last fall. But I think because of our advocacy work and because we were pushing back so hard uh, publicly, um, they actually delayed it, even though they probably wouldn't give, give us credit for that, but whatever. Um, uh, so like right now, we don't know when it's going to happen. Um, if you look at the articles that have been coming out, um, they've been saying like, oh, it could happen as soon as next week or it could happen in a few months. Um, so we don't really know exactly when it is that they're going to be voting on this bill or what exactly is going to be in it. But what we're making sure is just that we make our voices heard and um, make sure that it's not fully 100% regressive. So I hope that describes it. Yeah. yeah. And I guess another thing I would add to is the things that we're advocating for is three different things is um, trying to tax offshore profits. So when corporations put their profits, um, hide their profits offshore, uh, we want Massachusetts to tax a portion of that. Uh, the second thing is doing a tiered corporate minimum. So the corporate minimum tax rate hasn't, hasn't been updated in 30 years, and corporations um, right now pay $456. That's like way, I pay more than that in taxes. I, I'm sure that all of you pay more than that in taxes. And um, what we're proposing is a tiered system so small corporations can still pay a very low amount. But if you're like bringing in millions of receipts, you should pay more than $456. Um, and then the last thing that we are pushing for is corporate disclosure. So we need information uh, about how to close ta tax loopholes, who are the bad actors, um, and how much money each thing would generate. Because like one of the biggest um, challenges that we've had in the past year was trying to figure out like if we close this loophole or uh, tax this um, uh, incentive or whatever is um, how much money would that generate we don't really know because we don't corporations don't disclose that you know so 
Um, that's that's pretty much what we're working on right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I guess I'm going to be completely honest. I really liked BCC. Like, I liked how um, small the classes were and, like, how I could actually have, like, uh, relationships with teachers, I mean, professors here. Um, And I feel like I knew more about, like, what the college was offering for services or opportunities and stuff like that. Whereas when I, like, went to UMass Dartmouth, I really didn't feel like I had that, that time with professors um, that I wanted to or that relationship that I wanted to. Uh, also, um, it was, it, I guess it's, when it comes to like the coursework, I think it was pretty easy to like go from BCC to UMass Dartmouth, but when it came to like support, the support was definitely better at BCC. Um, than UMass because I guess there's a lot more students at UMass. Plus, I was also a commuter. I didn't live on campus, so I'm sure that that had other um, like effects or impact on, on my experience at UMass Dartmouth. But I mean, overall, I would say it was a pretty easy like transition into UMass Dartmouth. Um, it's just I I, I think. Maybe if I would have lived on campus, I, I would have had a different experience. But it was all right compared to VCC. I hope that doesn't scare you. Mm-hmm. I mean, the first thing I would say is, like, get involved um, with a local advocacy group. I know that, uh, of course, I would say and be biased and say, come to CSJ. Um, but there's also a FENOM, the Public Higher Education, Massachusetts, uh, I forget what it stands for, but they're a student group. Um, they actually work with us um, as partners, um, and they're right here at BCC. Um, and another thing I would say is, like, just going back to my experience of, like, being asked to volunteer and, like, not really wanting to, um, at that time, like, I kept thinking back, like, oh, I don't know enough about this. Um, I don't have a lot of time. Um, like, I, I didn't really feel comfortable just, like, going into a group of strangers that I never, like, uh, met before and stuff like that. But just taking that one step and saying, whatever, I'll just do it and see what happens um, was... I think, I mean, obviously, it put me in the place where I'm at today, but um, I feel like it's a myth with anything you do, even if it's, like, outside of politics. It's, like, don't limit yourself just because you don't know too much about something. You're going to learn about it in the process of, like, talking to people or reading about things. Like, I'm three years in now, and there's still so much that I need to learn. Like, um, so again, like don't limit yourself because you think that it's like too far off or you can't make a difference. Um, Just going around and knocking on doors for, I think it was like four weeks on my first campaign really showed me that people care. People are super enthusiastic and like happy to see you at their door. Um, talking to them about something that's going on or like updating them on on things like that Um, and like 
although sometimes it might seem like, oh, I only talked to this many people, um, that's not really going to make a difference. It's like when you're a part of a team that's all doing the same thing, it really does make an impact. Um, so, I mean, find, find something that you think that you would never be interested in and just go for it.